Good morning. Um, I am uh, Judy Miller from the Department of French Literature, Thought and Cultures. And thanks for coming, thanks for coming in this weather to the reading of uh, this reading of the Aeneid, which is an adaptation of Virgil by Quebecois writer Olivier Comed. Um, I had the pleasure of translating this into English in 2010, and it has had a very interesting life since then. With uh, We had a little hope that it might make it onto the Broadway stage. It never got out of a staged reading, but that was pretty good. But then the wonderful thing is that it sort of migrated to Abu Dhabi, where Yuna and Sarah uh, worked on it with our students there to bring it to life. So um, we will be reading the text this morning as a prelude to the discussion that we're going to be having around 10, 15, maybe a little later, about eco-theater. That is, about interpreting texts in ways that highlight their resonance with climate and environmental activism. Um, and also, we will be thinking about what we saw last night, right? And the work that Frédéric Aitouati did with Bruno Latour to make the inside, outside, the outside, inside, and to try and figure out how you stage inside, outside in an Italian ape theater. Bravo, I think, you know. So, um, so this idea of how one thinks about climate and the Aeneid was what Yuna took on as dramaturg and Sarah took on as director. And they worked this through the play you will hear. Uh, this production took place last fall. And for our reading, we have considerably shortened the text. Um, the text is, is actually in part narrated. Uh, and we've cut out most of the narrated parts. Um, and we've summed up some of the action in stage directions. So if you know uh, Virgil's Aeneid, you will see how Comed one adapted the sack of Troy, two Aeneas's meandering sea voyage, three the tragic romance of Dido, uh, here named Elisa and Aeneas, and four uh, Aeneas's founding of Rome, the story of the founding of Rome, and how this was adapted by Comed, especially in order to capture the plight of contemporary refugees. So I hope that the characters will fall in place in the course of our reading, but this is to help you kind of keep this straight. Rachel Watson, who co-directed this reading with me, will read the parts of Creusa, Aeneas's wife, of Pyrgo, a refugee woman, of Helen, the woman who lost her son, of Lucy, the well-off tourist, and of Elisa, uh, Aeneas's would-be savior. Tony Hawam will read the parts of Hector, here the seer who announces the catastrophe, so the world has been changed quite a lot, of Aeneas, the protagonist, and of Robert, the well-off tourist. Thomas Murphy uh, will read Corobus and Achates, uh, Aeneas' friends, and Anchises, Aeneas' father. He will read the role of Helen's husband, of the man in the squat, and the helmsman of the boat navigating Hades. And I will read stage directions and the roles of Barrowe, a refugee woman, also the hotel keeper, the immigration officer, and the madam, here known as the Sybil. A madam that is not as in madame, but madam as in, you know, madam. So the photos you saw, as I said before, came from Sarah Cameron Sunday's <coughs> staging in Abu Dhabi. Uh, at the end of the reading, there'll be a 15-minute pause, uh, and then a roundtable on ecology and theater with Yuna, Sarah, Frédéric, and me. Uh, and uh, I hope you will enjoy that as well. So here we go. Okay. The Aeneid, inspired by Virgil, by Olivier Kemed. Part one, fire. Scene one, a discotheque in a major city, Hector is yelling. Leave, leave, flee, get out of here, run, disappear. That's what I told them, but they didn't believe me. I told them, and I even mimed in case some of them couldn't understand, but it's always that way. Either you don't say anything, and then they yell at you for not saying anything, 
Or you say something and then they tell you to shut up. All the same, I told them they had to listen. The whole thing begins with a column of black smoke <laughs> rising in spirals in the skies. <laughs> there, right there. Then, after that, a second column, that one even blacker. <laughs> then a third one higher up, then a fourth, then a neighborhood, then the riverbanks, and soon the whole city. They don't believe me. Men, women, old folks, children, dogs run in the burnt air of the deserted streets, howling like wild animals. The ones crying are the victims. The ones roaring are the perpetrators. But you can't recognize anyone, not anyone, because everybody is completely covered with a thick coat of ash. Scene two. We are in Aeneas's and Creus's apartment. They are panicked. What's happening? Who are those people? What do they want from us? What did we do? They're burning down the city and everything in it. I don't know. Go get us, Canyas, and hurry. What do they look like? I don't know. Like us. They're like us. They're from here. Flames grab at their feet. Don't move. Let it burn. Leave it alone. As long as our house is in flames, they won't enter. They'll think we're dead. When the flames lick our feet, then we'll live. Our house will burn, but we will live. We will live. Scene three, a street, pandemonium. Corobus, Aeneas' friend, speaks. Aeneas, I've been looking everywhere for you, in the smoking ruins of your house, on the still intact terraces, in the soot-darkened alleys. Come with me. I have an old rifle aching to serve. There are 20 of us now, a hundred later. What does it matter? We have to defend ourselves. I won't go to death without taking a thousand with me. Come quickly. Time is flying. You too, Creusa, and even the little one. He has to learn to use a gun, so when we fall, he'll be able to avenge us. Corobus, I don't want to fight. I ask nothing of heaven nor of men. I put my family before my country. I'll find a safe place for them, and then I'll see. What do you think you'll do with your ancient rifle? There are thousands of them, Corobus, and you're alone. They're going to crush you, and even if you repel them, they'll come back, and their sons will take revenge, and the sons of your sons will take up arms. Our land is polluted. Nothing more will grow here. Scene four, a nursing home. Aeneas searches for his father and Chyses. It's no. I said no firmly once and for all. Go away. Why did you come here? Are you crazy, Aeneas? Flee. Flee while there's still time. I came to look for you. Have you had a good look? Do you think I'm strong enough to leave? If the gods had really wanted to keep me to keep on living, they wouldn't have permitted my city to collapse. Leave with your wife and your son. Leave quickly, I beg you. I order you. I already have one foot in the grave. I've been dragging out my existence for far too many years. You don't have the right to do this to me. Neither to me nor to our family. Together. We will stay together. That's all I want. Explosion. They're thrown to the ground. Gradually, they stand up. The road will be long. I don't have the strength to follow you. You won't have to walk. I'll carry you. I'm not waiting for another sign from heaven to convince you. Aeneas bends down, and Chyses climbs onto Aeneas' back. Creusa, give me our son. I want you to be able to run as fast as possible. Stay behind me. Don't lose sight of me for a second. We're going to the port. It's our only recourse. Scene five, the port. Aeneas is joined by his best friend, Akates, and other refugees. Creusa is missing. She has been killed, but speaks to Aeneas from the land of the dead. Don't fall. You don't have time to bury me. And besides, it will serve no purpose. It was said that I was not meant to leave our city. I'm tied to this shore. We can't do anything about it. Don't fall. You'll find someone else in another land. Don't fall. It is I who won't see our son grow up. It is I who won't take the long road to exile. Don't fall. If I hadn't handed over our son, 
You'd be alone. You must go on. He needs you. Watch over him. I will watch over you from the realm of the dead. I love you, Aeneas. I love you, and I wait for you. Part 2. Water. Scene 1. Ashore. Aeneas and his companions, Acades, Pyrgo, Beroe, Anchises, and Ascanius, arrive in terrible shape. The woman Pyrgo catches sight of the other woman refugee, Beroe, who's just torn a plant from the earth. What's that? I, I don't know. There's some black sap dropping from, it, dropping from its roots. It, it, looks, it looks like... Blood! Blood! There's blood dripping! There are corpses in the earth. When black blood drips from roots, it means that trees and plants are growing in corpses. Akadis joins Beroe, then all the others, except Pyrgo, begin to tear the plants from the ground. They smear themselves with sap. Deep moaning is heard, welling up from the earth. Scene two. A beach with tourists. Robert and Lucy are lounging. Lucy is reading a magazine. You know what I'm thinking? We should do this more often. Take a vacation. Is this great or what? I mean, stop for two minutes. Look at the horizon, the blue sea, look at the sun. Isn't this great? Isn't it? And we deserve it. Do we deserve it? Oh boy, do we deserve it? We worked and sweated hard enough to be here. I can tell you, I have no guilt. <laughs> But you have to take advantage of these moments. Know how rare they are. Maybe that's why they're special. Mm. We should do this more often, Lucy. Mm. What's hard isn't money. People think that money is what's hard. But if money is nothing, well, I mean, you know what I mean. Money when you have the minimum, sure. There are those people who don't have any at all, and that's terrible, of course, huh? I don't mean. But let's take those who have just a little bit, okay? Because you've seen for the price you pay when everything is included. Yeah, you can really see it these days. All sorts of people go to this kind of hotel, every class of people. It's terrific. It's real democracy, Lucy. Do you realize that even poor people can go to the beach? Listen, there are even some people who won this trip. They didn't spend a penny. It's unbelievable, don't you think? So no. So no. What's hard isn't money. What's hard is time. Time, Lucy. First, you have to find it. Where, when, how, the big questions. Then, you have to take it, where to take it, when to take it. And then the hardest, what to do with it. There are some people who will be stuck all their lives on one of these questions. Do you believe it? Ah, time. Everything's a matter of time. We should do this more often, sweetheart. I mean, go to the islands. This isn't the islands. What do you mean, this isn't the islands? Can you tell me how we should call islands if we can't call them islands, even if they're islands? You call them by their name. That's, what else would you do? Good. So the islands, or not, this is great, and not just a little bit great. Right, sweetheart? The South. Can I call this the South, or is that also a registered trademark? Call it whatever you like. Who gives a damn? This is starting to be too hot. I don't want to go swimming. I don't know what to do. That's right. Complain. Some people are working in the snow or the rain, and you complain because you're too hot. We're never satisfied. That's another problem. I'd even say that's the major problem of our... What's the matter now? Do you know if there's supposed to be some entertainment? I, I don't know. There are some people with weird makeup on and... My God! The refugees are crawling on the ground. Lucy screams. One of the refugees holds out his hand for a drink. I think he's thirsty, Lucy. Give him something to drink. Without thinking, Lucy holds out her cocktail. <laughs> Scene three. Inside the resort hotel, the hotel keeper is anxious. Do you, do you, 
you mind telling me what you're doing here? Oh my God, my God, oh my God, stay away from me, but I, but who are you? No, please, please, could you, please, would you ask him to put the chicken down right away? But I'm sorry, you don't have the right to come in here. We're a private hotel. This brunch is for hotel clients. You understand? Don't touch me. Don't touch me. George, George, we have a problem. George, security, right away. The police, too. Maybe the army. George, can you hear me? Listen, you're going to shut up for two minutes and cock your ears. We need a boat, food, water, and enough gas for a few days. Then we'll leave you alone. Scene five. The refugees have arrived by speedboat to another nearly deserted island. A woman arrives, running. She throws herself on Ascanius, tears him from Aeneas' arms. Dear God, thank you, thank you. Thank you, dear God. Helen. Dear God, blessed art thou. Blessed art thou. I knew it, I knew it. I told you and you didn't want to believe me. Helen, please. Look at him. He hasn't suffered. No trace. No wound, nothing. Beautiful like the first day. Helen. That's enough. Give them back their child right now. I told you to wait. I believed it. I believed it more than anything. I knew at the bottom of my being. I, I felt it. You feel this kind of thing. I, I'm not at all superstitious or even very practicing. That is no more than the next one. But there's, how do I put it? This link that we have weaved, that we knit beyond space and time. If he'd have been killed, I would have felt it here way down in my guts, in what had once been his home. That kind of thing doesn't lie. Men can't understand, don't understand, because they're powerless. Powerlessness is to feel nothing. Men only smell their own odor, the one that stinks of the fear of turning in circles. But all that's over, and you'll have to kill me to take him back. Do you understand? Kill me. That woman will not leave with my child. While I'm alive, she will not leave. I'll take care of this. I promise you. I'll give him back to you. Trust me. Night. Everyone is stretched out. Aeneas and Achates are whispering together. Aeneas. Aeneas, are you asleep? No. Where are we going, Aeneas? I don't know. We have to stop somewhere. We're all exhausted. I know. Why don't we hook up with that camp across the border? Because I don't want to live in a camp. It's because you'd rather not live at all. Uh, sleep instead of speaking such nonsense. The husband enters, speaking in a low voice. He holds the child in his arms. Protect your son. Love him. Cherish him. Don't bring him up on hate or resentment. Don't name our enemy. Let him know what we've suffered. That, yes. But keep him from coming back. Find him a land that will gather him in. A welcoming land. A safe land. And we, the barely alive, will live in his memory like shades without haunting him. Scene 7. The refugees have left the last island, again in a boat. There is a storm. Everyone is silent. The winds roar. Aeneas narrates their plight. A black night now shrouds the abyss. We feel the cold that unhinges members. The gray waters swell. The storm clouds amass. Then the great liquid plain erupts. The wind begins to mix up heaven and earth. It blows so hard it raises the billows up to the stars. From the great depths, sleeping layers ascend to the surface. A sea mountain suspends us on the crest of the waves. Then we fall back into a yawning swell so deep we can see bottom where frenzied sand is boiling. I hear my people's cries merged with the motors knocking, with the hulls cracking. Everything here smacks of death. And when the sea's rage throws us onto invisible rocks, we think we've arrived in Hell's Cauldron. Part 3. Earth. Scene 1. 
an immigration office in another city. The immigration officer and a refugee named Elisa are arguing. I'm sorry, Elisa, you have to be patient. Before being patient, I have to eat. Right, of course, I know. But I can't issue you a work permit as long as your status isn't recognized. You have to understand my situation, Elisa. I left my country in order to survive. It seems to me that that suffices to make me a refugee. You left your country. You weren't expulsed. It's not the same thing for them. I left it before they could expulse me. We wouldn't be in this situation if the reverse were true. If the reverse were true, I wouldn't be here because I would be dead. That's what they're trying to decide in studying your case. I believe you, Elisa, of course. But I don't have the power to give you refugee status. You have to understand. What am I supposed to do while I wait? You stay in the transit center. You wait until your petition for asylum is registered. Once it's registered, you'll get a receipt. So what exactly do I do with a receipt? Calm down. This document will keep you from being deported. Deported? If I'm not here yet, how can I be deported? Signature. One simple signature from your hand. And I'm a free woman. I tell you, I can't do a thing for you. You must assure me you return to the transit center. Otherwise, I'll have to warn the local authorities. You do your work well. I know your goal. Your only goal is to discourage us from ever entering your territory. But I must tell you something. It's useless. It'll never work. Misery is a wind that will never desert our sails. Set up your barriers, put up your fencing, build your walls, crisscross the ocean, comb all the deserts of the planet as much as you like. We'll still keep pouring in. We'll unfurl in waves on your white beaches, and you'll never be able to stop the flood because you can't stop the ocean with your arms. Scene two, a squat in the same city, Two men, the Gatherer and Aeneas, are there. Elisa enters. The Gatherer whistles. Good evening, madam. Welcome to my realm. He gets up, approaches her. Elisa backs away, sees the other man. Hello. You won't get much from him. He's been here for several days, and he says nothing about nothing, nothing at all. A real crazy, a crazy if you ask me, a crazy with a poor little boy. Huh. Is there a place to wash up? Good. Of course there isn't. No toilets, no bathrooms, and I strongly suggest you don't try the public toilets. The police have staked them out, naturally. If you don't want to be sent back to the camp or thrown out in the desert, you'll have to be Discreet. It's not easy for a woman, right? I mean, to be all alone like this. Wouldn't you like a little more comfort? I have a mattress if you want. I told you I don't have money. I didn't say it cost you money. <laughs> I'm fine here. Listen, just who do you take yourself for? I'd like to know. You land here, you have nothing to contribute, you install yourself in a corner, and you put on airs. So get over here, damn it. He approaches Elisa. She pushes him away. He tries to force her. She fights. Aeneas gets up, immobilizes the gatherer, threatens to hit him. The gatherer pulls a knife and tries to wound Aeneas. They fight. Just the right move, the knife enters. Two bodies slip to the floor, then we see Aeneas on his knees before the gatherer's body, his hands red with blood. Scene four, an apartment in the city. Elisa, Aeneas, and Ascanius have settled in. There is a knock at the door. Aeneas drags himself to the door against his will, sees Achates, freezes. Who is it? Aeneas? Who's at the door? Achates throws himself into Aeneas' arms. I've been looking for you for months. Aeneas untangles himself. Elisa, this is Achates. His best friend, his brother. He must have told you about me. Well, 
Yes, of course. Elisa exits. Tell me what's happened since the storm. I don't know anymore, Akaris. I've forgotten a lot of things, and I don't know if I want to remember. Who is that woman? Is she from here? No. But she's not from home either. She has a work permit, she has a job, a place to live, and we managed to eat. What about me? Did you know if I was alive? Did you care? Are you happy to see me, Aeneas? Listen to me. I came to find you. I need you. We need you. Our path doesn't stop here. There's nothing in this town for us. We must leave. I'm alone, Akadis, alone with a child. There's a woman here whom I love and who loves Ascanius. The three of us are happy together. We don't have much, but we need nothing more. And your son? Do you think he'll be all right here? An emigrant. He'll be an emigrant all his life. They'll never let him in. Wherever he goes, he'll be an immigrant. Not if we find him his own land. There is no more land, Akadis. Everything has been distributed. The only land left is in the desert or under the sea. What are we supposed to do? Steal property while watering the soil with the blood of the vanquished? Become like those who kicked us out? I can't do it. Scene five, a window in the apartment. Aeneas alone, the ghost of Creusa appears. You have a past etched in you for always and a future towards which you have a stupendous duty. A memory and hope. Between these two huge and heavy realities, you're but a hyphen. Nothing more. A simple hyphen. You must accept it. My life was taken from me. Let it go. Don't try to take it back. Don't try to go back to what you were before. Your old life is asleep at my side. You must find another one for yourself. You have the chance. And you have our son. I don't know where to go. Your father will tell you. My father? He died in my arms. I'm alone now, with your ghost as the only souvenir of my past. Creusa disappears, then noiselessly, Aeneas picks up Ascanius, looks for a long time at the space around him, gets ready to leave, and find Akadis. Alisa enters. Do you care to tell me where you're going, Aeneas? Forgive me. Don't, don't do this. You mean to leave without saying anything else? Forgive me. I know I'm the lowest of men, but if I stay here, I'll be the death of us all. And by leaving, only I will die. Aeneas and Ascanius join Akadis to continue their journey. Part four, in the bowels of the earth. Scene three. Aeneas and Akadis are in what looks like a brothel. They're bargaining with the madam, a sibyl. If you want girls, no problem, I have something for every taste. If you want something else, you're at the wrong address. It's for something else, and I know we're at the right address. What exactly are you talking about? You know very well what we want. Just give it to us, that's all. Hold on, hold on, hold on a minute. Take it easy, little friend. You're not the leader of the pack here. First off, I don't know what you're talking about. Second, I don't give anything. I sell. That's not at all the same thing. I ask you exactly what you want. I want to see my father. The Sibyl puts a tablet on her tongue, passes it to Aeneas and Akatis in a kiss. Listen well now. In a few minutes, you'll descend to where few men go and from where fewer still return. Akadis and Aeneas are beckoned into a boat. They speed through the black waters of the river. We hear babies crying. At one point, Elisa appears. Later on, Corobus. The helmsman steers them farther and farther into the darkness and speaks. Be careful. We're arriving at the crossroads. To the right is the path of just punishment that leads to the pit. There you'll find those who hated their brothers, mistreated their fathers, and deceived all manner of men. To the left, the landscape is cheerier. There are fields bathed in sweet light. There are the happy dead. 
those who by their intelligence made life better, those who by their art tried to civilize men, those who knowing that others would come after them wanted to leave a trace of their passing more potent than an Arab trench. Aeneas sees his father. Father, I don't know if everything I'm seeing is true, but I know one thing. I don't want to fall, because if I fall again, I'll never get back up. Tell me where I must go, what I must do. Listen well, my son. You have to know how the world works if you want to move forward. And here, we can finally see the order of things. First of all, Aeneas, look at the sky and the continents. Then the liquid plains, the shining globe of the moon, the radiant fire of the sun. These are the fires that made possible the birth of men and beasts, those who fly as well as those who undulate under the marble surface of the sea. All these animate things have within a fierce vigor, a celestial imprint. But very soon, matter takes us over and makes us heavy. Fear just as joy, desire just as sorrow, and thus we are slowed down by earthly life. Sometimes we become such prisoners of darkness that we no longer feel heaven's breath. Then comes the great day of eternal night. Life leaves our bodies and looks for refuge elsewhere. Souls weighed down by suffering drag their pollution to some infernal spot. Souls light with happiness spin to the tune of intangible winds. But all finish in flames, for the fire that reigns over virtue and vice cleanses everything. And when the long passage of time permits us to refine the beginning's mark, we await in the fields the moment of inhabiting once more earthly bodies. You carry the seeds of your civilization. You have the power to found nations or destroy them. Aeneas, my son, your quest is coming to an end. The land you're looking for, you'll find when you leave your hate at the foot of a barbed wire fence. Don't forget to make rules for peace. Respect the vanquished. Disarm the conquerors. Marry a local woman, someone connected to the land before you, a woman whom you will love and cherish. Mix your blood with hers. Don't wait for war to do it. And then, a new world will be born. It will be ours, Aeneas. Let it be beautiful, this one. Part five, blood. In this last segment of the play, Aeneas and Achates, having recovered from their drugged trip to Hades, find themselves with Ascanius in a dangerous refugee camp. There, the old timers try to keep them from receiving food, from finding their place, from surviving. However, with the help of Lavinia, the camp nurse and Aeneas's new partner, Aeneas and Ascanius make it through the barbed wire into a new land. Achates dies along the way, proud nevertheless of founding an empire for those who have something broken in them. And Aeneas, speaking to an elderly man in the new land, concludes. Don't be afraid. I left my hate at the, f at the foot of a barbed wire fence. What I want is peace. Peace is what we all want. In our defeats, we saw enough death. We passed through enough territories emptied by exile. We don't want us through the plains with our bodies. Aeneas sets his bag down. End the play. <laughs>